implement dealers. As a small guy, you know, it just seemed like it had everything. My great aunt and uncle farmed a couple miles out of town, and one day my great aunt it was not unusual for her to come in and, and visit. What was unusual about this day was she wasn't herself. Um, she was talking about what she felt her future would be. The, bit, the steps from retiring off the farm into town, into a nursing home, and into heaven. And it seemed out of place, even though she was a Sunday school teacher and, and, a, and a Christian lady. Then she got to a, a remark that I will never forget. And she said, I'm just a dirt farmer. I didn't understand until a couple of days later how that related to the net to what she was saying. Because the one business in town that I didn't mention was a grain elevator. The grain elevator door had been locked. The phone had been disconnected. Most of the inventory was gone. The owners were gone. And so was most, a lot of small farmers' livelihoods. Fast forward that to today. I'm grateful that she was there and said that. For when you or an associate, someone you know, gets to the place they feel that they're just a dirt farmer, listen. Be available to them. And if it comes down to you and you can, Give yourself a break. Now the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now the five words. Is there truth? Is there fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And is it fun? Beat and greet. Thank you. Let's welcome all of our guests. Okay, it is tumbler time. 
So please consider donating $5 or so if you have to the uh, little cups on the table, unless you have a, neat, a green dollar sign on your badge, which means you contributed up front. And we can always graciously accept additional donations, so we're always happy to do that and give our Tumblr money counter something to do today. So where in the world is Club 27? Woohoo! Well, we had a fantastic turnout at the blood drive that Blake Park Zoo uh, co-sponsored with us. The zoo staff was wonderful to volunteer their time. And I just want to tell you quickly that the, the Red Cross was elated. The donations were wonderful. They achieved their goal of collecting 32 units that day, 26 of whole blood and, and 6 units of power reds. And what they really liked was there were 13 brand new donors there that day. So thank you for being part of that um, project and being part of giving the gut blood. I tell you what, they can't keep blood on the shelves and store it very long. And the blood banks and the patients will be forever uh, grateful. And sadly, there's going to be more demand for blood already. They're talking about it in the hospitals here from the incident today. So check this out if you're going somewhere. And um, take some photos, even if you're doing something fun and exciting here in town, let us know what you're doing so that we can share it. We love to hear what's going on and we'd like to go with you. I really want to thank uh, Jeff Stickle for representing our club so many years and working with both Terry and Ed Arnold and the Iowa Wolves on this exciting project that uh, they're going to be here to tell us about. So I'd like to let um, Ed finish his bike there and invite, <laughs> invite trying to give you a heads up there, and invite Ed and Lori to come up and talk to us about what's going on with the wolves. Help me welcome Ed and Lori. Thank you. Well, as uh, Becky said, thank you very much, Becky. Uh, uh, said I'm representing the. Uh, Actually, all of the clubs in the Des Moines area in our Iowa Polio Plus game with the Iowa Wolves. We started this 15 years ago with the Iowa Energy, now the Iowa Wolves. Jory and I are making the rounds around the area uh, clubs. And uh, just as an aside to kind of not follow up, but um, follow up on President Becky. We were in Perry yesterday. And uh, it's kind of had significance for me in a couple of ways in that my cousins, two cousins got polio in 1951 and my older cousin Jerry turns out was a student teacher at the old Perry High School on Willis Avenue in 1963 or whenever he was a uh, student teaching while he was at Iowa State. So I kind of took old memory trip and gave Jory a trip on uh, what's going on and then as we got into the meeting Story, maybe we'll tell you about her experience, but it's a small world and the rotary world is really great. But Jory's going to tell you a little bit about uh, Timber, uh, Timberwolves basketball. I guess maybe I'll just start first of all and say, make it short and brief. This is our 15th year, and Jeff has been on our, Dr. Jeff has been on the committee, I think, for 15 years. And with thanks to President Becky, I don't think she realized that Jeff had been on her committee for so long, and so she volunteered to come uh, before she knew that Jeff was going to volunteer to do it. So we have a lot of support within this club on our committee. We've raised over $150,000 in the last 15 years. This will, be our, this will actually be our 14th game. But that is enough with the bill going to Gates two for one match. We've raised over $450,000 which is enough to immunize 750,000 children against polio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what we're asking you to do is to buy a couple of tickets, sell a couple of tickets. Hopefully we can do that, but if you buy or sell two tickets for $40, those are discounted tickets. Uh, they're usually $26 to $30. That'll be enough. That'll provide $20 for uh, Rotary International. Bill and Melinda Gates will match that with another $40. So that's $60 that will go to the Rotary International. That $60 will immunize 100 children. So when you present this to your friends, say, hey, would you like to immunize 100 children against polio? 40 bucks. It's a deal. Good basketball game, good deal, uh, good entertainment. I'll have Jory tell you all about the Iowa Wolves and what's going on. 
Yeah, thank you all for allowing us to come speak. Um, so the Iowa Wolves Polio Plus game will be on Friday, February 23rd. Um, typically it has been the first Saturday of February, but we're switching it up this year. Um, this game is an expected sellout game. So we're encouraging ticket sales early to guarantee that you guys will be in the lower bowl. The QR code that you guys can scan, I have um, flyers and also on the sheets that I see on your table. You can scan the QR code and you'll be able to purchase tickets that way. Um, you guys are guaranteed down in the bowl if you purchase early. The 200 and 300 levels of Wells Fargo Arena will be opening up, but you'll still be able to buy tickets through this QR code in the link. Another thing, if you guys are looking to donate tickets to a nonprofit or another group and they are unable to make it to this game, please let us know. We are more than happy to coordinate with your group and their leaders to get them to come out to another game. Um, because this is going to be a sold out game, we want all the people that will be buying tickets for this game to be there. Um, so if you're looking to donate tickets and don't know if they'll be able to make it to the Friday, February 23rd game, please let us know and we can coordinate with them to get their group to come out to another game. But we're super excited. Um, it's going to be a great, great game. Um, we're going to have NBA halftime entertainment. It'll be a lot of fun. Our Timber Timberwolves Day game. So um, it'll be retro Timberwolves jerseys. 90s music playing so it will be a lot of fun and hope that you guys can join us bring out your friends and family so yes any questions yeah. any questions okay. thank you uh, our, our partnership with the Iowa Energy and now the Iowa Wolves has been really a good one and uh, Jory and uh, Alex have just been over backwards to help us with ticket sales and to accommodate us, if there's anything you need, like she said, with the donated tickets, we need to just get a hold of Jory or Alex directly, and they will make sure that the tickets are in the same area and and uh, are good seats. So, thank you for your past support. We appreciate you helping us out this year. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Actually, and I didn't know Jeff's been doing this for years. I just wanted to come find out more about it because <laughs> polio is why I joined Rotary. That's awesome. Happy, happy to have you here. And now Dave Ducey, who's our past president and is currently our program committee vice chair, is going to introduce our speaker. And Dave's agreed to give us a blast from the past from his news days. Well, just the newsman in me uh, interested in the situation in Perry today, and uh, the Perry latest I checked before coming up here is that the authorities are confirming that the shooter is dead, presumably a student. Um, it has not yet been confirmed by authorities, uh, but also that the school principal is among the victims, um, and that's all they're saying uh, at this point. But uh, reading between the lines does not sound good uh, for, uh, for the principal and several other students injured as well. So our thoughts and prayers are with everybody uh, connected to the Perry school system uh, today. But we're here with a different focus, and that is as we look out over this wonderful view of our beautiful city, our focus today is going to be out up there on the horizon and beyond, uh, because that's what our speaker is going to be talking about. Bill Menner is founder of the Bill Menner Group, a consulting firm focused on community development, rural partnership, and economic vitality. He is contracted to provide executive leadership to the Iowa Rural Development Council and the Iowa Housing Partnership. Last month, he was appointed a senior contract advisor to the USDA's Rural Development Agency. That's a lot of contracts, uh, Bill. <laughs> uh, which he previously served as state director during the entire Obama administration. As state director, Bill oversaw support for housing, community building, energy, and business development across rural Iowa. During his term from 2009 to 2017, USDA Rural Development invested more than $5 billion in loans and grants to rural communities. Prior to joining the Obama administration, Bill was Economic Development Director for uh, Grinnell. Uh, he, uh, you think he's particularly good looking and intelligent, it's because he started his career as a public radio reporter <laughs> uh, in Ohio and uh, in Iowa. Bill volunteers for a lot of agencies uh, in and around the Grinnell area. He's a native of Cleveland, Ohio, with a BA in journalism and a master's in political science from 
the Ohio State University. Please welcome. <laughs> Thanks for this opportunity. Um, someone wrote to me today, one of my former colleagues from uh, USDA, who, who's a Hawkeye, and he said, what's harder for you, the fact that the Buckeyes got humiliated in the Cotton Bowl, or the fact that Michigan is in the national championship game? And I said, the Michigan national championship game, by far. I, I, I told him, I said, I've never rooted for Alabama in my life. And I had all my roll tie roll, you know, <laughs> cheers going the other night. Um, but uh, I, I had spoken to Rotary Clubs, as I've mentioned, to someone all over the state. And this is the first time I've ever been here. So I appreciate this opportunity to visit with you. And uh, I, I'm also the father, father of four. Three of them moved away and they're still away, doing great things. One of them came back. He's a high school teacher uh, in Grinnell, so today's news was scary. <coughs> Just out of curiosity, how many of you are from a rural community, grew up there? Define that. <laughs> well, USDA definition is under 50,000 for business programs, 20,000 for community programs and housing, and 10,000 for water and wastewater. <laughs> so how you define rural is really interesting. How many of you grew up in a town of under 10,000? How many of you still have family in those communities of under 10,000? How many of you view yourselves as a rural island? It, when I led USDA for those almost eight years, um, I, I would often ask when we had state meetings, and that, when I started at USDA, we had 120 employees. They have about 57 today. But I would ask them, how many of you are from small towns? Every hand went up. I said, how many of you still live in that small town? 80% of the hands went up. And I said, and of those of you who aren't in the town where you grew up, how many of you were within a 20 mile radius? And practically every hand went up again. So, so part of it is a cultural issue, I believe. You know, how do rural folks, not just rural Iowans, but rural folks in general view themselves? And how do they view themselves even after they leave? Um, as Dave mentioned, I, I'm not a small town boy. I grew up in the suburbs of Cleveland. I mean, in reality, it was a suburb of 13,000. There was actually a little agriculture there. There are four different vineyards in the town I grew up in. Um, so there was actually a little bit of agriculture there. Not much anymore, but back in the day, there was a lot. Um, so I, when I got that, that gig at USDA in 2009, um, folks back home, texted me or called me or emailed and said, the heck do you know about rural development? You're from Cleveland, Ohio. And my response was, well, yeah, but this is 2009, and I've lived in Grinnell, Iowa now for 19 years, and I think I've figured out a few things about small towns. And they said, point well taken. Um, I've now been in Grinnell for 33 years. Uh, we came here in 1990 because my wife got a job as a tenure track professor at professor at Grinnell College and when I went to get my first uh, driver's license they said will that be the two-year license or the four-year license and I said make it the two-year license because I won't be here that long and 33 years later here we still are um, and um, we are as embedded in our community as we could be if we were native Iowans. Um, and there's something special about this place. There is something special about Des Moines. Um, I started commuting here in 1993 to cover the State House for KUNI. Um, a lot has changed since then. I started working for U.S. I worked for Tom Slater uh, at State Public Policy Group for a few years in the late uh, 90s after I left KUNI. Uh, and then came back in 2009 to work for USDA and had an office in the federal building that looked out over the state capitol. 
I had an apartment at 13th and Locust for a few years uh, during that second Obama term because I was getting tired of commuting. Um, so I know this community well, and I know the folks that lead it, and, and I have friends in this room, and it's great to be here. Um, but the work that I'm doing through my consultancy through the World Development Council, and there's propaganda on the table for the World Development Council, uh, and in partnership with Empower Rural Iowa, which is the governor's task force on rural communities, and now my new opportunity to work with my old agency as a senior advisor, um, a good friend of mine who was my colleague in the Obama years as the state director in Virginia, uh, is awaiting Senate confirmation to be the new undersecretary. And we've been trying to figure out a way for he and I to work together again. And it turns out that making me a contract employee and not a USDA employee was the quickest and best way to do that. So I'm officially a contractor of uh, the US Department of Agriculture, not an employee. Um, and we're still kind of, I have a USDA phone in my pocket, um, but I'm not a USDA employee. What I do have the opportunity to do though is use that platform to help inform the undersecretary and the team on what I've learned in my work in Iowa and working with rural communities across the country. So what do we know about rural? There's a quick and dirty. Older, sicker, poorer, less educated is what you often hear. Well, in part that's because that's what the numbers tell you. We are older in small towns. We're aging. Our younger people are moving away. We are sicker. There is more chronic disease in rural communities per capita. We are poorer. We don't make as much in small towns because the wages aren't as high. And we are less educated for the most part looking at the numbers of folks who have four-year four degrees. We also happen to be more entrepreneurial, more likely to start a business also more likely to own a home, more likely to have served in the military. So, you know, these things all balance out. And we know that there are ways that we can go about as rural places working to address those challenges. And there are challenges. You know, when I go to a rural community working through the Rural Development Council or through the other groups that I work with on my consulting business and ask them, what are your big issues? I can almost predict what they're going to say. <clears throat> Housing, broadband, health care, child care, access to capital, the usual. <clears throat> but then you start digging a little deeper. One of the biggest challenges that faces rural communities uh, is a lack of capacity. In small towns, and, and Randy, you mentioned the town of 500, in most, every town of 500, that town is being run by a city clerk, usually a woman, who is trying to balance everything that goes on in that small town on behalf of a mayor and a city council who are elected and who are, who are volunteers. That city clerk, if I call that city clerk and say, hey, USDA has a great grant program that's going to help you address water or uh, build a new community center or support daycare. All you got to do is fill out this application and then get the money and then report to us on a quarterly basis for the next 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and that city clerk's going to look at me and say, I don't have time for that. Um, but there are towns of 500 who have remarkable civic leaders, sometimes elected, sometimes self-appointed, sometimes foisted up from the back saying, step up and make things happen. Um, and remarkable things are happening in those small towns because they are finding ways to address that capacity gap from the inside. Um, and I always rattle off the same towns and Maybe you're from one of them originally. Stanton comes to mind. They do amazing stuff. Manning does amazing things. Um, my new favorite is Kiyosakwa. They're, they're, they're one of the groups that has worked with Empower Rural Iowa. 
and the uh, United First Aid, which is an attempt to address rural EMS shortages, and this is something that the Lieutenant Governor has, has championed. Kiyosakwa has dived into that. Uh, Manchester is doing great stuff. I mean, I can find these nuggets of places. We have over 800 small towns in the state. How do you how do you bottle what's going on in a handful of these places, and 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 try to disseminate those best practices, blueprints for success in other places? Well, that, that's sort of what um, the Rural Development Council has been doing. Sort of what Empower Rural Iowa has been doing. Um, sort of what I hope that USDA Rural Development continues to do. And, and as I reacquaint myself with that agency, and, and the fact that they were created, you know, USDA Rural Development wasn't always called that. Uh, they used to be the REA, Rural Electrification Administration. And the reason the REA was brought into being during, during the, the New Deal was that the, the private electric companies didn't want to run uh, electric lines down uh, dirt roads to serve a few farms. The private sector wasn't stepping up to support electrification in rural America, so, well, the government's got to do it. And what Congress found, whether it was rural electrification or rural telephonication or rural internet, was that sometimes there's a role for government, especially where small towns are, are con concerned. Because of that, A, lack of capacity, B, lack of capital, see lack of people, um, someone's got to backfill some of these needs. And, and that's why USDA Rural Development is there. And, and Teresa Greenfield is the state director, great friend of mine. She has this job and she's done uh, great things. Um, but they can do more and I think that's what the new undersecretary Basil Gooden recognizes and I think that's why he wants me to help be part of his team to help push that ball uphill and make sure that they're doing all that they can, but they're not doing it alone. Uh, Becky was a great partner when she was at SBA, and she and I wound up in lots of meetings together figuring out ways that federal agencies can work together. The whole reason there's a Rural Development Council in Iowa and 18 other states was in 1992, George H.W. Bush said, there needs to be more cooperation and collaboration. There's too much duplication. Let's create an, an entity that pulls everybody together in every state, federal agencies, state agencies, utility partners, schools, nonprofits, for-profits. Let's make sure that they're working together and they're not duplicating services. And so that's why there are World Development Councils. And today, our State World Development Council um, uh, a 501 c3 with a 10 hour a week executive director um, reaches more than 800 people every week trying to build capacity share best practices tell stories about small towns that are doing great stuff and every april we get together for a rural summit this will be our eighth annual rural summit this april in ames and we'll have about 400 folks from rural communities coming together to learn, um, to network. And it's not about folks, not to say bad things about Des Moines, it's not about bringing Des Moines folks to come in and preach to them about how to do their business. It's about lifting up these local stories and having them tell folks how they did it. So that the folks in Stanton can tell their story and the folks in Maquoketa can say, wait a second, if Stanton can do that, we can do it. Or grab that Stanton person after the, the breakout session and say, give me your template for success. I want to replicate what you did down there and do it up here. There seems to be an affinity for that learning, that they want to learn from other like-minded, like-populated places. It's one thing for, and, and, and honestly, when I tell folks, I'm from rural Iowa, I'm from Grinnell. The real rural Iowans <laughs> roll their eyes at me. <laughs> oh, you're a town of 9107. You're not rural anymore. Come see me when you get to 550 or Kiyosakwa 980. Um, the different challenges. Of course, 
in Washington, D.C., they wonder how many stoplights Des Moines has. <laughs> uh, it's all a matter of perspective, but, but that issue of capacity and the ability to look down the road and think about how do we address quality of life issues, and you can define quality of life in any number of ways, but that specific place has a vision for what they want to do, and we got to figure out ways to empower them. Having the governor recognize the Rural Development Council as her partner for Empower Rural Iowa. I was with the Lieutenant Governor last night at an event with some of our corporate sponsors who helped make our work possible. He's a great champion for our work, and in part it's because we're all of the above. There is strength in numbers in small towns and rural regions and rural places. And I always conclude my talks by quoting Ben Franklin, because it was he who said to the founding fathers, fa all fathers, all white fathers, and said, gentlemen, this is before they, you know, before July 4th, we can hang together or we can hang separately. <laughs> and there is great benefit to hanging together, and I feel that is the case with rural communities. And if you take a look at that propaganda and something in there occurs to you or you have insights that you think I can take back to that council and the great leadership we have, just grab me afterwards. Um, but thank you for all you do collectively uh, and thanks for the work of this organization and appreciate the time. And I'm happy to take questions now or later. Yes? I, I have one suggestion. Can you move that summit from Ames to Des Moines? <laughs> we have, the summit was first held in 2016 in Jefferson. Then we went to Grinnell for two years. Then we went to rural Ely, better known as Kirkwood Community College, for one year. But the folks in Western Iowa said, oh, we don't want to drive to Cedar Rapids. So the best we can do to fit a group of 400 people into a space with breakout rooms, Ames is kind of our de facto. And, and I think we, we've even done a, a survey to summit goers. If you can pick any place you would want to go, would you factor it on rurality, um, uh, venue, or do you care? And the, the overwhelming response was, Anywhere but Des Moines. Oh. <laughs> oh. It's, it's, it's the capital. <laughs> too, too big. The antithesis of rural in the minds of any rural island. Greg, you should introduce yourself. Come on. <laughs> well, Greg and I go back. When it comes to economic diversification, you know, one of the opportunities in Iowa is energy production. What does the, uh, the Economic Council do to help communities and landowners, for that matter, that might be considering solar or wind production? Because counties struggle with, you know, certain ways to, to permit this. Are you guys involved in that, or will you? We we tend to be more of a conduit for information. For example, I know that USDA and the Department of Energy are about to hold some uh, events that help um, elevate siting challenges and opportunities related to both wind and solar. Um, I, I think there is a recognition that that. Energy has a chance to um, to be an economic driver in rural communities, um, but it's all about place, and there are places that are choosing to permit otherwise. Um, and what we've tried to do, and again, it's not it's not about saying this is how we're doing things because we actually don't have an advocacy position, we don't have a lobbyist, um, but we do tell stories. And what we have talked about is how places like uh, Pocahontas is using their um, property tax income from wind farms to supplement school projects, um, or how local residents are saving money by installing solar. Not making judgments, but sharing stories. And, and there are folks who say, we, we don't want wind in our backyard, uh, it's a it's aesthetically not pleasing to us, um, and I my I mean between us my question is often I wonder what folks said you know back in 1933 when that first power line came through town. Yes, uh, 
rural hospitals are facing a lot of uh, stiff uh, situations now. Is there specific efforts being done to support, maybe even with just best practices, uh, transfer of knowledge uh, among rural hospitals? Uh, well, we do have uh, at least one individual from the Iowa Hospital Association here who might know more. But what I can tell you as a former hospital trustee in Grinnell is that um, there are new um, design, there's a new designation, a rural emergency hospital, where you give up your opportunity to have inpatients in favor of a higher reimbursement rate. We already have critical access hospitals, which were a recognition 20, 30 years ago that there needs to be a change. Grinnell actually is not a critical access hospital, and we were losing money hand over fist, and we wound up merging with Unity Point. It was either that or we would have gone away in the pandemic. I'm actually going to be speaking at the National Rural Health Leadership Conference in Orlando next month. And I think those are the sorts of venues, and the American Hospital Association, the Iowa Hospital Association, does some great sharing, but um, that, that health can be, when I mentioned it, health care access is a big barrier for some small towns. It's absolutely the case, and what you raise is a great idea. There has to be some sort of best practice out there, and I think rural hospitals tend to gather in corners of meetings and figure things out. I, I don't want to overstay my time. You're good. Okay. Yes, John. Bill, my understanding from talking to some people who are involved in that in the community development, that one of the biggest problems that smaller communities have in their efforts to, to move ahead is to, is basic leadership. Somebody who can take an idea and lead a group of other people to to the completion of a project. What, what are your viewpoints on that? I've failed already because I haven't been repeating the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the question was recognizing that some of the challenges is having someone to lead the process. Mm -hmm. how, how, do, how are we addressing that? In fact, um, Empower Rural Iowa has helped launch with the, the Rural Development Council's help of leadership exchanges which are opportunities for communities to come together. Most of those communities or counties already have existing leadership programs. We're actually having a conversation right now with Alliant Energy about creating some sort of a rural elite training opportunity, whether it's a two-day event or something else that really digs deeper. It's almost gonna, our hope is that it might be like an MBA for rural leaders that talk about process, that talk about different layers and styles of leadership, and more important, as you, I think, as you're referencing, it's the nuts and bolts of making things happen. A lot of the things that happen in the Stantons and the Mannings of the world are because people are, have figured out how to make things happen, and they're able to, to drive that, and, and it's because great folks are, are making it happen. So, thanks for that question. Yes? What are you doing? anything. What are you doing, if anything, about public education? You're not going to go anywhere successfully if we don't start funding that. And it's, it's I, yeah, uh, full disclosure, I, for 43 years was a history professor at, at a community college and so on. So that's do you want leaders and so on? You need, and we used to, for what? In the 70s, we put a schoolhouse on our centennial? Yeah. What's, what's the matter, William White would have said? What's wrong with Iowa and public education? Clearly, there's a correlation between that and Florida. The question is, what, what is the Rural Development Council? What are we doing about public education? And I think the answer is um, we're elevating the opportunity for those organizations to be part of our network, to elevate their issues. At the end of the day, this is about voters. That this is about, this is a public policy issue, and if voters feel strongly about schools, they'll vote for schools whether it's for a bond levy 
or in a school board election or in a state legislative election. So at the end of the day, a lot of things, and not just education, a lot of it comes down to folks in rural communities making decisions for themselves and how they want to how they want to fund those things. Thank you. so much for his informative presentation and for the work that you're doing for our state and our rural areas. As a token of our appreciation, we've donated a book in your honor to the Des Moines Public Library, and that book will become part of the Rotary Rosie Reader Band. Uh, it's a collection that travels around Des Moines taking reading to the people. And our club donated $40,000 to the Des Moines Public Library Foundation to purchase that band in 2020. So here's a review of some things that are coming up here in the new year. We've got lots of fun opportunities coming your way, so please mark your calendars and take advantage of some of these. Second Chance Tuesday is coming up next Tuesday, uh, January 9th at the Big Grove Brewery. Fun and fellowship is always free, but the drinks and food are on your own. Our February Fling, hosted by uh, President-elect Kevin, is going to be Friday, February 16th. You should have received your invitation postcard in the mail just recently, and there's an email that will go out today for you to sign up. And then also, as we heard earlier, our February 23rd Friday Night Polio Plus with the Iowa Wolves basketball game. So, we're looking forward to getting the year off to a great start. Our upcoming speakers, uh, and I want to remind you always that you and guests that you wish to bring need to RSVP by Wednesday 9 a.m., the day before the meeting, and you cannot register guests, but you need to do that through contacting Kitty. But next week, we will hear some more on Iowa Economic Development and also the Finance Authority from the Director, Debbie Durham. January 18th, and our own uh, member, Ann Shamir, the CEO of Blake Park Zoo, will be here to share information on what's going on down the road. And then on the 25th, Google <coughs> Public Affairs person, Matt Sexton, will be here to talk with us. So we've got uh, outstanding speakers coming, as always. We've got wonderful activities. I want to thank all of you for being here today. What a great turnout the first week of the year. It's just fantastic to see your smiling faces out there. So let's make sure that we continue to make this club the best that it can be and make 2024 a banner year for our club. And all I can say is, until we meet again, let's get out there and have fun and do good in the name of Rotary. We are adjourned.